Hello, um, this is Roya Gaffele from Oxfirst Limited. I would like to welcome you to this webinar, which is held out of the University of Oxford. Um, I have next to me Professor Graham Richards, who will lead um, this seminar today. Uh, the occasion of this seminar is that we have just published a new book, um, which treats um, university intellectual property from a managerial and financial point of view. Um, the book was published 9th of July 2012 and um, the, the purpose of this webinar is to present the book and to discuss latest insights and trends um, from the book. Uh, Professor Graham Riches was the um, head of the chemical department in Oxford University and under his um, direction the chemical department became one of the biggest um, in Europe. He also was responsible for creating the Tech Transfer Office um, of the University of Oxford, ICES Innovation. And he also did spin out a couple of companies um, of Oxford University. The most um, well-known one was Oxford uh, Molecular Limited, um, which was sold for, for a fortune um, many years after it got started with, with a relatively small startup company. He's also the director of Catalyst Biomedical Limited and he's also the chair of IP Group. Um, IP Group is now uh, publicly quoted um, as a company that is responsible, as a private equity company that is responsible for, for spinning out and commercializing university technology and intellectual property. Um, I'd now like to pass on the floor to Professor Graham Richards um, to give an overview of the book and following his first um, overview of about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, I'd like to present them some further insights on, on what, what I consider um, a strategy to wake a sleeping giant. Um, I'll pass it on now. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Graham Richards here from a and Oxford where for once it's not raining today. The <coughs> subject of university intellectual property <coughs> is really quite a hot topic at the moment. Uh, the reasons are not hard to understand. The driving force is above all financial pressure. Governments and fee payers want to limit their contributions. And in the <coughs> search for extra finance and impact, the attention of the universities is increasingly focusing on the exploitation of the intellectual property generated by the academics. But the situation is quite complicated and the sort of questions we have to answer are what constitutes intellectual property, who owns it, how can it best be exploited. And after reviewing the recent history and current situation, what we then have in the book are the views and experiences of a series of experts in the field. And these range from a very senior lawyer, Sir Robin Jacob, who is probably the senior IP lawyer in the UK, a patent attorney, a solicitor, and the views of people involved in technology transfer. And then to have some balance, in the last chapter, we have a provocative look at the ethics, uh, where there are views that um, universities should not exploit its intellectual property, although I have to say I think that is a rather realistic view. I should say that I am not a lawyer, but as Roya said in the words of introduction, I have had uh, a lot of experience in exploiting university intellectual property. Um, I spent 50 years in Oxford uh, and I also had extended periods in California, at Stanford and at Berkeley. The increasing <clears throat> pursuit of commercialization need not undermine the other things that universities do. It was true that Hardy, who was a Cambridge mathematician, uh, once toasted the Cambridge Mathematical Society saying, he is to pure mathematics, may it never be applied. But his wish was really in vain <clears throat> because there's no science that one can't exploit. Uh, a rather wiser man, Sir George Porter, uh, once said there are only two sorts of research, applied research and research which is yet to be, uh, be applied. And in my experience, the most successful and financially rewarding returns have actually come from the exploitation of what was started off as blue skies research. So there's no real reason to change the emphasis towards the exploitation uh, that the academics uh, set about. My own personal story <coughs> really started in this tale in <coughs> about 1978 when I became chairman of uh, Oxford University's 
uh, University and Industry Committee. And at that time, the university would not let us consult on university note paper uh, because they were worried about being sued. They were totally worried about risk. <clears throat> but then, as Roya mentioned, in the late 1980s, I founded a company called Oxford Molecular. Uh, we started that with £350,000 of venture capital, um, took it up to be a public company worth £450 million, screwed it up, and sold it for £70 million. The more interesting, <clears throat> perhaps, example I had was when I became head of the chemistry department, I had to raise uh, a lot of money to build a new lab. And I found as a novel source of funding doing a deal which, with what were then City of London stockbrokers, Beast and Gregory. And they provided me with £20 million up front in return for half the university's equity in spin-out companies uh, coming out of the chemistry department. That was, has been very successful. My single department has contributed to the university over 80 million uh, as a result of these sorts of things. Beeson Gregory was then merged with Evolution. Uh, they created a subsidiary, originally given the rather dot comish name IP to IPO, uh, of which I was chairman. This became IP Group, which is now a main board. FTSE 250 company, which has partnerships with a dozen UK universities. And we have founded some 70 companies, of which more than a dozen uh, have had IPOs. Of the various forms of intellectual property, <clears throat> the bit that people are most interesting, interested in is, of course, patents. And the Patent Act in the UK placed the ownership of intellectual property generated by employees who were expected to produce patented work to their employer. In the case of industrial companies, that's all very simple, because if you work for a pharmaceutical company in a research department, then developing new drugs is your job, and your employer obviously expects to receive the rewards. Universities are less clear-cut, and there is a question, are academics expected to produce IP? It can be quite hard to convince academics that the IP uh, that they produce should be owned by the university rather than themselves. I had a long time trying to get that across to my colleagues. The difficult uh, proposition that at the moment you own the IP, in the future I will own it and you will be better off. And that in fact is true, of course, because if the university owns the IP, then they pay the patent and legal costs. Most universities in the world now do own the IP of their academics. What is much less universal is the situation with respect to students. And it is very important, I believe, that the university should also own the intellectual property of work done by students working for their PhDs in research groups. If this is not the case, then this can cause real problems if you're trying to get money from venture capitalists. When they do their due diligence, there's uncertainty about the ownership. However, if the central university owns the IP, then there have to be mechanisms for uh, incentivizing people. In the Oxford case, when we create spin-out companies, uh, typically, uh, there are great variations, and everybody involved should have their own lawyer. But typically, 40% goes to whoever puts up the money, 10% um, kept for the management, 25% to the university, and 25% to the academics. So that there is a real incentive. In the case of licensing, uh, the Oxford system, <clears throat> which I actually helped to devise, gives virtually all the early income to the researcher up to about as much as they would earn in a year. And this is an incentive to researchers to seek patent protection. But then there's a sliding scale, so that as the sums become larger, the percentage going to the university increases. So in the rare cases when the in invention brings in many millions, the um, university will get large amounts of money. So patents are complicated. Uh, but relatively well understood. If we then look at copyright, <coughs> the situation is much less satisfactory. 
and I think it's going to cause a lot of fuss, <clears throat> as I know this having uh, mentioned this uh, in a number of quarters, uh, to academics that the university should own their, their copyright or, even a or at least a share of it. I think this should be the case on grounds of fairness. When a scientist is working in a university lab, they discover something that leads to a patent. And it's now generous, generally accepted that the researcher and the employing university should share the rewards on some equitable basis. If, on the other hand, uh, a colleague of that scientist is writing textbooks uh, on the subject for which they're paid to teach and do research, then at the moment, universally, the royalties go to the author, which doesn't really seem totally fair. Uh, and again, rather as licensing, it would make sense if small amounts, relatively small amounts, maybe doubling someone's salary went to the academic. But if very large sums were made, um, as is the case when people write books and make television programs, I have colleagues that earn several hundred thousand pounds a year out of royalties alone. And copyright has got more complicated still recently <clears throat> as a result of the internet and the use of IT by lecturers. <clears throat> Increasingly, contemporary students don't like using, uh, having lectures using talk and chalk. Blackboards are even considered to be safety hazards. So that lecturers produce uh, material, put it on the web, it's picked up by other students, taken to other places. It is quite a mess and it is not at all clear who owns what. If the university owned what the lecturers uh, put onto their uh, websites, then it would be much easier to control that. The next form of <clears throat> intellectual property I'd like just to mention briefly is trademarks. Uh, universities have been very lax at protecting themselves in this way. Oxford is a case in point. It failed to register the coat of arms of the university, which had been in use for centuries. And so in the 1960s, it had to develop uh, a new form of the symbol. But that's not the one you find on uh, on uh, on t-shirts. Even more surprising, Oxford University Press, which has going, been going since 1473, didn't protect itself until the 1960s. Uh, when it had a fight with Robert Maxwell about calling things Oxford. And finally, <clears throat> in terms of intellectual property, academics consult and give expert advice, such as acting as expert witnesses. And again, this is a somewhat uh, unclear area, since they only get this work by virtue of the job they do in the university and their host institution. Uh, but it is very rare that the university <clears throat> gets any benefit. And I think technology transfer offices should increasingly uh, keep an eye on this and help because if there is a good professionally run uh, technology transfer organization, it can manage consultancies on behalf of the academics. In general, it's true that academics are very bad at negotiating fees. I like to recount the, um, I think, not apocryphal tale of the Oxford academic who was invited to appear on a BBC television program for a fee of 50 pounds. He wrote back immediately accepting the invitation and enclosing his check. Academics are not good at doing these sort of things. And it's true that people like academic lawyers can occasionally re, uh, receive enormous sums in arbitration cases, cases where they are only involved because of their university appointment. So how are things now? In the United States, uh, the Bayh-Dole Act had enormous and I believe beneficial changes the number of patents increased about tenfold in the decade following uh, by Dole. The <clears throat> National Academy of Sciences has recently, uh, in 2010, undertaken a major investigation to see uh, how by Dole works and, in general, has come out uh, very much in favor. There are, of course, those who are unhappy about Bayh-Dole <clears throat> in the sense it gives private firms the rights to inventions <clears throat> generated at public expense. But there are margin provisions and royalty-free license <clears throat> arrangements for governments. In the UK, things changed, uh, as many other things did, uh, with Mrs Thatcher. 
and the modern era was much influenced <coughs> by the Second World War when uh, in the dark days of 1941 when Britain came into the war, when, when Britain was alone in the war after the fall of France and before the United States joined us, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill came to a, an agreement, the Lend-Lease Agreement, whereby uh, the United States got permanent bases in the West Indies from us. But not many people are aware that the UK agreed also not to patent radar, the jet engine, and penicillin. So we gave away probably thousands of billions of dollars uh, as a result of that, although it did help us to win the war. At the end of the war, the fact that we had given away a lot in terms of patent rights was uh, realized by the Attlee government, and they set up the National Research for Development Corporation, which owned all the intellectual property. But their track record was not particularly good, and in the days of Mrs. Thatcher, they turned down monoclonal antibodies as not being worth patenting. And so she changed the rule, and since then, technology transfer from universities, with the universities owning the uh, intellectual property, has become the normal rule. We do in include in the book, as I have mentioned, uh, a chapter from the uh, Manchester Manifesto group, whose slogan really is, Who Owns Science? And they take the view that um, work done in this way in universities <coughs> should be freely available. Um, I can't agree with that view, but it is one we need to keep in mind uh, in, in keeping some balance. Uh, it seems noteworthy that most of the signatories to their manifesto are philosophers and ethicists rather than scientists. <coughs> but the one major exception is the prominent Nobel laureate Sir John Salston, who led the work uh, in the sequencing of the human genome uh, at Hinkson near Cambridge. Uh, and no doubt his views must have been colored by the extraordinary antics of some of the commercial bodies trying to patent genes. But I would like to point out that his work was funded by the Wellcome Trust, whose wealth really comes from patents from the pharma pharmaceutical industry. People often consider that academics are rather soft and simple. Uh, I don't want to take too much time, but Occasionally, academics can uh, uh, be quite uh, unethical and crooked, and many of the problems we had in Oxford way back <clears throat> stemmed from a case in the 1920s when our professor of agricultural engineering uh, was a swindler, um, caused the university to be sued for £750,000, and he himself ended up <clears throat> in jail for four years. <clears throat> While he was in jail, uh, it's believed that he swindled the warders out of their savings. So one has to be reasonably careful dealing with academics. Um, the academic world is probably the least regulated of any part um, of commercial life. So <clears throat> I should sum up and say where I think we are now. There's little doubt that the exploitation of university intellectual properties is here to stay and to be expanded. Financial pressures uh, demand that. This does not mean that academics lose their freedom to research on problems of their own choice. What universities need are policies which ensure that abuses are avoided. And it's important, as I mentioned, that the intellectual property ownership is clear in the contracts of the, uh, the researchers, and preferably the university holding the title, including the work of students. There then has to be an equitable distribution of any income generated, perhaps with incentives to encourage protection prior to publication. And the university should provide provision for researchers, departments, and outside bodies to resolve questions of conflict of interest and other grievances. And this is best done by mediation and arbitration rather than going to court. The maintenance of a precedence book is very wise, and also it would help if academics and institutions kept better records. Governments could help by encouraging standardization of ownership of intellectual property and having more universal patterns of financial return. This would help when you have to collaborate between, with two institutions and indeed to deal with industry. 
It's important not to overstate the financial return likely to accrue to universities, but there may be huge winners. But because smaller institutions may find it hard to run their own technology transfer offices, sharing with other uh, campuses has to be considered. And again, to do this, generic forms of agreement would help. The question of copyright is a vexed one, but I think it has to be raised in all questions of fairness. Students are very attracted by the exploitation of intellectual property, so there are educational opportunities in teaching entrepreneurship. It is the case that more than 90% of discoveries never make it to the real world. And to address this problem, a group of Oxford students have recently set up a company, Marblar, which intends to use crowdsourcing uh, to get the worldwide community <coughs> to come up with suggested applications uh, for technology which is patented. And already this has <coughs> led to discussion about a new startup company. We've come a long way from the era when academics thought commercialization was a grubby activity. But we make, need to make sure the pendulum doesn't swing too far in the opposite direction. But as I've mentioned, most of the really big successes have come from Blue Skies research. I believe that in the future, above all, academics should be encouraged to ask themselves in what way their research may be of most significant impact and benefit to society. Now this may be by disseminating knowledge freely, but increasingly the answer may be by exploiting the intellectual property. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot um, for this talk. Maybe um, the story of people not thinking or giving away their intellectual property may date back to some interesting incidents during World War II. But when Lehman Brothers collapsed uh, and Nomura bought up um, much of the company, by coincidence, Nomura forgot to acquire the intellectual property of, 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 of Lehman Brothers. And now Nomura is very hard trying to build around all of the assets from, from Lehman Brothers without owning the IP, which is a big challenge. So there's a certain history and people do not necessarily learn from that history. I would now like to move on um, to um, another part of the book, um, which is about um, commercializing university research, taking a more contemporary view on the subject matter. Um, I called that chapter of my book Waking a Sleeping Giant because I think there's a lot of opportunity out there that has not yet leveraged to, to the full extent um, possible. Um, so here just, and, and because I was so curious to actually explore the opportunities of what intellectual property can do to academic research, I launched Oxford Limited as a kind of like a test case to what extent um, the very concept of intellectual property can contribute to impact and concrete deliverables for corporations and for, for public sector institutions through, through the logic of IP. And Oxfirst has now been in place for over a year and has been very successful and has delivered high impact results to, to many different corporations around the world. And, and I'm really proud because it's in a way a, a kind of like an illustration of, of where the future of research, the future of people who are curious to ask new questions and deliver results may really be. Um, maybe going back in history, um, if you look at the history of economic growth, um, strange enough, the elites um, of um, Europe before the Industrial Revolution had about the same GDP per capita as the elites of um, ancient Rome. Growth, um, we didn't really see any significant growth rates from the time of Jesus Christ to a prior Industrial Revolution time. It was really just um, during the Industrial Revolution, during the introduction of new technologies, of innovation, of, 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 of engines, of, of, of patentable products and services, um, that we saw acceler accelerated growth rates from an economic history point of view. Now, if you go throughout the 20s and 21st century, you see accelerated growth rates at an incredibly fast pace. Um, which maybe puts also the whole question of sort of like are we in a recession, etc., in perspective. If you think that for 2,000 years we didn't see any growth rates, um, so 
the question I was interested in this to, to, to look at in this chapter was sort of like, um, can, how, what type of tactics can there be to commercialize university research? Can there be kind of like a new way or a third way? And in order to answer that question, I first was keen to sort of like deconstruct some of the myths that we usually see, sort of like um, one of these big myths is that sort of like um, the academics are the ones who do research and the companies are the ones who pick up this research. Um, and this applies some sort of linearity where some people do the thinking and then some other people do the commercialization and it's a linear thing. Uh, I don't think that that is the situation. I think we see many corporations that are doing at least as much research um, as universities do. And it is, rather than a linear process, it's a circular process. It is sort of like we're embedded in a knowledge field where various actors are contributing to a specific knowledge field from different perspectives. So I think this linearity is a misconception. Um, the other misconception I wanted to, to deconstruct was that um, presuming that um, universities can only transfer technology is also a bit misleading because what universities can essentially transfer is knowledge, knowledge in all of its forms, knowledge in all of its aspects. It is not only just about um, engineering and, and chemistry and physics, but it's about commercializing. Questions asking how to commercialize new perspectives can be found nearly in any discipline of academic research. So uh, on that basis, I, I, I suggest something that I call the third way that looks sort of like at, at knowledge transfer, tech transfer as a, as a social practice where actors from various perspectives come together for the, for the sake of advancing our understanding on a given topic, but also try to explore how to commercialize it. Um, so I was first interested to look at what's current best practice, um, and then I'm going on to explain a little bit what, what this third way looks like. And I think an impact assessment is also important because you need to know um, yeah, what all of this um, delivered in the end. So w when we look at top performing universities in the area of tech transfer, um, First of all, I think one should not assume that the average European university is going to be where MIT stands. I think this is a wrong um, aspiration because um, the U.S. universities are uh, embedded in a different social context and in a different political context as the European universities. What's interesting about this chart is not that MIT is on top and, and, and Chalmers is at the bottom, but where, what type of sources of funding are there for academic research uh, and for, for tech transfers? So I thought this was very interesting. Um, obviously research funding that's coming on from business, from NGOs, which again illustrates sort of like that this ivory tower is a is sort of like is another cliche from the past because with research funding coming on from business, it illustrates that business has a certain interest in asking new questions but may not have the time um, in-house to, 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 to pursue these type of questions. Um, so co joint research um, between business and universities, seed capital for spin-offs, and I think another third important source of income is coming from consulting fees, royalties, and licenses. Again, with a strong emphasis also on consulting opportunities, showing that it's not only like the hard IP, the patents, but a lot of soft IP um, that, that, that generates income for, for the universities. Um, maybe um, Talking about this, 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 this breaking up stereotypes, um, the difference between a university and a business is in many ways also a hypothetical difference, a hypothetical distinction, because if you look at what constitutes a business model, a business model means you're providing um, value added to someone else um, and you're charging um, in order to cover your costs something for that. So you're providing some services that have some relevance to someone else in exchange for that you, you're keeping some, some money so that you can keep yourself going and maybe even make a profit. Now this is what businesses do but if you look at this definition of what constitutes a business this is exactly also what universities do. So um, this hard borderline, this is business and this is university is, is really a, a misconception in, in many different ways. So if, if we turn to this question of where, what are the sources of funding, I think we can see that there are many informal and formal sources. So on the most formalized ways, this can be about sort of like taking equity in a company or like, um, yeah, 
trading IP at online platforms, um, and from the informal sites, doing contractual research, um, consulting work, um, joined, joined as alliances with business. Um, and these joint alliances with business are important for many ways because business has sometimes insights that academics can't have because they don't have that exposure to the practical world. And, and this can be a very valuable way to, to increase um, to increase the insights um, for academia as well, so it is not sort of like I mean, obviously it, it can it can go in strange directions, but generally speaking, it is a wonderful opportunity for for mutual learning experience and for mutual um, beneficial um, um, outcomes and, and deliverables. So, so what we did then is just we looked sort of like what what indicators work in order like what 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 what's the emphasis here that that very, very top performing schools um, initiate in order to, to assure that there's some knowledge transfer and we saw that there's, there's sort of systematic um, there are similarities so there's something about like ownership of IP usually by the university um, IP awareness training on campus very important um, do people have any idea about what what IP is about um, government grants public sector fine um, one thing was interesting, social responsible IP transfer and open source strategies with respect to IP. Um, we could only find that in Berkeley. Um, none of the other schools have yet started to, 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 to do research around that. And that has probably something to do with Berkeley's strong culture in the area of open innovation. Education around entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship funds, um, training in business plan development advisory services, um, availability of external consulting firms. So if you look at the tech transfer in the University of Cambridge, it was essentially founded because around Cambridge there was a ring of consulting companies that started to pick up the research and the, the findings and the insights in the university and started to, to commercialize it. So it wasn't the university in and by itself a fault in the first instance about how to go along with that, but it was external consulting firms who started to get active here and, and take ownership of the opportunities associated with that. Um, so student entrepreneurship, um, very important. Are there organizations around there on campus where people can, can, can test case and can try out how to be entrepreneurial, how to be proactive? Um, what commercialization services are there on campus? Are there opportunities for, 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 for researchers to sort of like um, reach out um, to, to, to relevant uh, institutions? Um, Sources of funding, uh, seed capital, um, is there like uh, like other sort of like additional um, incubators uh, in, in in proximity, uh, and then the whole issue of like who owns um, shares and spin-offs and licensing, and and what incentives are there for commercialization? I think this is a very important point, which we could only find in in Chalmers School of Technology, which is a, a small school in Sweden. Um, how, what are the incentives for academia? If we want to assure, I mean, all of this has this underlying theme that universities and business do need to collaborate in order to promote growth. I think especially in the European Union where we are facing many, many challenges with respect to growth management, it's really important that players from various sides come together to collaborate. And we do have evidence from economic theory that um, tech transfer and promotes economic growth. The catch is we don't we know it as a big scheme. We don't know exactly the details of one, under which conditions it actually works. But but if we have all of this understanding and if we know that as society, universities and business do need to collaborate for the greater benefit of, of humanity actually and for, for 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 economic prosperity, then it is very strange that if you look at the incentives and if you look at how academics are being um, are get their are getting their promotions um, that collaboration with business is not one of the indicators that will get you a professorship. Um, it will not get you also a senior job in an academic institution if you bring in a lot of um, private sector experience or if you can say, well, I have I have, I don't know, I, I own so much intellectual property and I made sure that my students find jobs and I had all of this strong collaboration with, 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 um, with these corporations, um, it's not something that will win you, um, that will that will win you a, a career. And this is a, a mismatch at the moment that, that that we see in many many different schools, where we have at the government level a huge aspiration for tech transfer and knowledge transfer and knowledge commercialization and so on. But then, if you look at the incentives that that 
various ac that the academics are facing, the incentive is how much knowledge are you putting in the public domain. And the more you succeed in putting as much knowledge as you possibly can into the public domain, the greater chances are that you go further in your career. So we have kind of like a, a mismatch between what, what, what public policymakers are saying and what they want from universities and, and what's probably also very helpful for, for knowledge and growth and, and, and what the actual reality is on the ground where when you start doing all of this you may run into serious trouble with your supervisors because, um, because of conflicts of, of interest and, and so on and um, so, so mismatch here. Um, so if, if you look at, 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 at knowledge transfer, I think what's important is to understand that this is sort of like, first of all, it's a contact sport. And secondly, it's, it, it's an embedded system. It, it's sort of like it's an activity. It's a, it is not, the, the question from an academic point of view is not going to be fixed by just establishing a tech transfer office um, and just putting it in, in, in one part of the school and say, well, we have a couple of people in the tech transfer office, therefore we have tech transfer office. Um, what works much better is if the tech transfer is sort of like all over the place and if people have awareness about that and if people have, um, if academics especially have any type of motivation and incentive within their own career um, aspirations and goals built in to actually undertake tech transfer. Um, it's not fixed by just outsourcing it to, to jump into some institution that has as a label, I'm the tech transfer office. Um, very important in that context is also entrepreneurship training related to intellectual property. Are we building up a future generation of graduates that are just really sharp on the academic side of you, but are really not clear about how to run business, how to be entrepreneurial, how to do business? Um, I think it's a, we, we do have a responsibility to build up people who will who'll perform in business as well. Um, so, so from a policy, I think incentive structures are, are really important. Developing boundary spanning, uh, entrepreneurship training, institutional support, and adequate funding. All of this is kind of like saddened if you don't have adequate funding. This being said, I gave some, I, I did some consulting work many years ago in Indonesia, and Indonesia set up its tech transfer offices with something like ten thousand dollars each, and somehow they still made it. Um, so it is feasible if you're really willing, but. In general terms, it's you, you do need adequate sources of funding. Um, so how do you assess impact then with all of this? I think um, what's important in, in this whole impact assessment, obviously, that you take a look what's the situation before and after and so on. Um, but that you look sort of like, well, cost-benefit analysis, what are direct costs, indirect costs, what are benefits, and what, what did we get out of this program? And I think a checklist is very helpful in this report. So um, are there any government-wide policies to contribute towards the use of IP and intellectual capital? Um, to what extent does the performance review of faculty members include off-campus activities? I'm not aware of any performance review currently in any of the universities I have been working at that included off-campus activities as a, as a plus. It was more something like for what you had to get permission and which was rather complicated to actually do, which is very regrettable because if we have that aspiration of impact, then in the UK now 20% of academic performance has something to do with impact, with how much did you, what was the impact, what was the outreach other than just publishing. And if that isn't linked to your performance review at the micro level, there's a, there's, there's a gap here. Um, boundary spanning, what's happening in order to bring people together, um, to talk, to bring people to the table, um, to, to, to assure that there, there are adequate relationships, um, awareness raising programs, especially with respect to intellectual property. Um, it is very sad that in most schools intellectual property is only taught at the law school because intellectual property is of relevance to many different faculties um, who, who lack sometimes awareness and may give up wonderful opportunities for, for negotiating their part of the deal because of a lack of awareness and understanding of the concept. Um, institutional support. Uh, so is there science parks in the, in the proximity, incubators, um, are there feedbacks from different levels um, to improve institutional support for commercial activity, um, funding opportunities, like do universities look for funding other than for government grants, um, is there, are they trying to generate off-campus benefits from research projects, um, generate income through, through, through spinning out companies, licensing out IP, consulting services, 
and 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 do the students also get education to scope with new business uh, to, to to handle new business opportunities and to start new firms I, I think many European countries face the challenge that still the next generation um, thinks the one most wonderful thing in the world is to be a civil servant um, which is certainly a wonderful thing to do but um, if we want Europe to, to be the Europe of innovation and, and growth and prosperity it will be really important that we not only build up um, civil servants and administrators but entrepreneurs and um, that training starts at the university if not even earlier so this is about like the, the, the finalization of my talk. I think the main the main takeaway from this is really that I think there are a couple of of stereotypes um, from both sides um, that sort of like the academics are this type of abstract lunatics who are just doing some strange writings that nobody can really leverage and on the other side that business is just there to pick up the research um, and not do any analytical work themselves either that really require for a revision and for rethinking of how we are conceptualizing knowledge transfer not tech transfer um, because if, if we keep working with this outdated um, constructions of, of a really fundamental paradigm for, 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 for economic growth, it will be very difficult to find new new tactics for, 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 for actually realizing it at the microeconomic level what we know already from a macroeconomic point of view of what, what does um, promote economic growth. So I'd like to summarize that, um, talk, draw the talk to a conclusion and, and open the floor to, to questions and answers um, through the webinar. What do you think of the current approaches to standard agreements, e.g. Lambert in the UK? How should these be improved? Almost every university has <laughs> different situations, so having a standard uh, agreement, standard uh, returns would make life a great deal easier. Uh, you could, universities could then collaborate more easily, and this is particularly important if they, <clears throat> as seems likely, start sharing technology transfer offices. But again, dealing with, uh, with business, if there is a st standard form, uh, it would make life a lot easier at the moment. Uh, it's a bit of a jungle. The question is, how should royalties be divided between <clears throat> the university, the lecturer, and the student? Uh, what has worked well in Oxford is weighting the uh, return to the people who do the work, that is, the academic and the student, uh, <clears throat> in the initial stages. And that encourages people to protect their work. How much should go to the academic and how much to the student really depends on the, on the case and there has to be, I believe, a conflict of interest uh, committee where particularly students could go and complain if they think they're being badly done to. But most often the, it's the academic who had the idea and the student who has just done what he or she has been told. But if the, if the idea has come from the student, then the student should get uh, r rather more. Our sliding scale system, I think, works quite well. That is, if there's, say, £50,000 earned by licensing something, <clears throat> then the academic uh, and his collaborators should get that. But if the license brings in several million, then the university should get uh, a, a lot more. And so we have a sliding scale. Uh, and that, that seems to be uh, to work well because people see that is, it is fair. The question was, what is the name of the cloud sourcing company? It is Marblar, M-A-R-B-L-A-R. -A -A they do have a website. I have another question with respect to um, IP trading platforms. There are a couple of trading platforms, um, like there's the Teos um, Patent Books, there's also IPXI, there's Yet2.com, um, which are all seeking to sort of like, um, well, establish a secondary market for intellectual property, a market where sort of like the, 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 the um, not the IP is being 
traded, but sort of like options in the IP are being traded. Um, to my knowledge, we don't have yet a huge track record illustrating or demonstrating um, success, but um, all of these companies got heavy venture capital funding and will have to be seen to what extent um, they can deliver. I've just had a paper published on this area on uh, secondary markets for intellectual property. It is on my LinkedIn profile and if you're interested I, I'd be happy to, to email you this paper as well which discusses financial exchanges for patents um, and the establishment of secondary markets, um, kind of like financial markets for, for patents. Uh, are there any other questions? If so, could you please um, type them in the in this question um, panel or in the chat room? No. Okay. There are no other questions. Then we'd really like to thank you for um, your time, your attendance. Um, I hope that uh, everything went well and that you could hear and see everything um, as it should have been. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted with the next webinar series. There are a range of webinar series coming up in September um, on, on patent quality, on crowdsourcing, on tech transfer, on various issues relating to, I, to, to technology and public policy. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot an email. We'll probably do something also over the summer so that things that we don't shut down our brains while being on the beach. Um, thanks a lot for, for listening to this webinar and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Goodbye and thank you very much for giving us your time. Have a good morning, evening, afternoon, depending which part of the world you're in. Goodbye.